today. Back it is what it is. Or it added is. meetings. Okay. Back to back and then added meetings. I had a meeting with the mayor scheduled 20 minutes before the meeting started. That right. I put on my schedule. Like, wait, what? Girl. Right. Who does that? Who Boy. does that? All right. Well, welcome to my high performance at High Noon Call. I'm Joyce Johnson, work life integration strategist, and very excited to start today's call. And um, so, do I even have any announcements today? I don't know. Listen, if you want to do more of what you love, hit me up. <laughs> That's my announcement for today. This call is every Wednesday. It happens at 2 p.m. I'm sorry, at 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern and 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, and I want to talk about decoupling some things today. So I think I'm just going to jump right in. I think I'm going to just jump right in. So I want to talk about this concept of decoupling because I have been noticing this um, with clients, but then also I have like some examples and some stories about how it's shown up in my own life and the process that I had to kind of go through in order to, to come out of this, right? So when I talk about decoupling things, what I really mean is there is two things that could be related, but aren't actually related or they should not be related. And how do we split those things apart in our mind in order for us to change and shift our perspective and to basically create a perspective that works better for us? So I wanna start by talking about how we decouple our ambition from the approval of others. And noticing at times that a lot of our ambition can really come from the way that we perceive others will perceive us, the inputs that we've received from our family or society that tells us these are the types of things that make us successful. And so therefore we create and put a lot of ambition behind them. So one of those things for me, for example, that shows up um, is in the space of real estate. Like, just to be clear for everyone, I actually don't love real estate. Like, it's a thing. <laughs> it's a, it's, it is a wealth building, like, tactic, but it's not a place that I have, like, great passion for or anything like that, right? It's a thing that my ambitions purely are related to the way that I see my wealth building strategies, and so when I get like a lot of questions around real estate and things like that, like sometimes I've had people who have hit me up and they're like, yeah, I just want to sit down and have a conversation with you about real estate. And in my mind, I'm like, how do I, <laughs> like, how do I tell them to like, I, I mean, unless you're about to give me a strategy that I could use for my stuff. Like, I'm not interested, right? Like, I, I'm not interested. Um, and so, like, understanding where my ambition comes from. But I'll kind of get a little bit deeper into it in terms of, like, how those things can show up from the expectation of other people and then, like, what that looks like for, for you know, for us internally, right? So one of the things that has been probably the most, um, what, actually, I'm, I'm going to go back earlier and then bring it up. So when I joined the military, this was... This is like detrimental in my family. So my my sister is eight years older than me. And my sister went from like, she graduated. She got into a top school. She went to Emory University. She went straight through four years, right? So her four, first four years, like I'm still a child, okay? So my sister, eight years older than me, she goes to college. She goes through, gets her degree and I'm still in high school, then my sister goes and gets her master's degree and I'm still in high school. Okay. So my parents had this expectation and this, you know, this <laughs> concept that like I was for sure going to go to college. And because I did well in school, traditionally, like in high school, I breezed right through high school um, with no problems, breezed right on through. So 
it was just this expectation. Like I'm clearly going to go to college and my parents didn't see it any other way. So when I made a decision that I was going to go to the military, like this was not, this was not welcomed in my family at all. And so like a lot of parents potentially, you know, well, and I went after 9-11, so there's that piece, but like a lot of parents would see, you know, some ambition in there, oh, you're going to go into the military, you know, and try to encourage like how that career is going to shape out. This was a fight in my in my household. Like it was not a welcomed experience, and it was literally like arguments between me and my mother, and arguments between my mother and my father. Um, and some of that goes into like how I went in. I went into a, something called a delayed entry program, and that kind of gets us off track of the of the thing. But like these were full scale arguments in my family about like what I was going to do and how that was going to be supported. So when I decided to go into the military, instead of getting a degree, it didn't matter how ambitious I was to pursue my military career. It didn't matter if I had a track. It didn't matter if I was picking a great job. It didn't matter if I was getting promoted. Like none of those things matter because as far as my mom was concerned, her approval lied in me getting my degree. So by the time I did decide to go back to school and get my degree, like this was, this was not, this was not like. I mean, for my mom, it was just like, it was, it was a dead moot situation. Right. And so like, we've had these conversations about the fact that like, she did not like my, my mom would talk about how my sister is a teacher, how my brother is a firefighter. And then she'd like get quiet. And it's like, okay, well, there's me, there's me. I I'm here. Hi. So it can be hurtful when your family doesn't necessarily recognize your ambitions because they don't meet your approval, their approval. And so oftentimes we have, we will, um, we will couple that together, especially if you have a family who does have some expectations or who does have, you know, a, a way that they see that things should go. And we see that oftentimes in like foreign families, um, more so than we see that in American families, but it exists here in American families very much as well, especially if your family, you know, believes that you have this potential to do something amazing and you're not holding up to what they believe you should do. And then how is our ambition tied to how they see that? So then fast track me a little bit forward. I get out the military. I'm like working in corporate America. I've gone back to school, got my degree, um, you know, kind of done some of these, done some of these, you know, traditional things. And then I decide I'm about to become an entrepreneur. So if you're familiar at all with the world of entrepreneurship, especially full-time entrepreneurship, then you understand how full-time entrepreneurship can go in waves. It can go up and down. Sometimes things are going great. The next thing you know, you're, you know, experiencing something down, then you go back up. I mean, and it can just like, it, it moves around. So now I have my bachelor's degree. Now I have my master's degree. And every time business is going well, my dad is like, okay. That's cool. As soon as I experience any turbulence in business, the immediate thing is, so when are you going to go get a job? So when are you going to put that degree to work? So how long are you going to do this entrepreneurship thing? I've been doing it for eight years full time, by the way. Like none of that matters, right? Like I've had to explain to my parents at times, like I pay people salaries, dad. <laughs> like, I don't know that I'm going to go get a job where I'm expecting someone to pay my salary, but it does not matter. It doesn't matter what awards I've won. It doesn't matter like how great the business has done. It doesn't matter how many people that I've paid. It doesn't matter what achievements that I've had. If I allowed for my ambition and the way that I pursue entrepreneurship to be anywhere tied to or based off of how my parents see entrepreneurship or, or seeking any part of their approval, then we would be at odds and I could be discouraged from actively pursuing and so there have been times that I've had to like pull back and not have so many conversations because I'm now having a conversation that's not on par, that they don't understand. And then I have to work through the disapproval, the disapproving looks, the disapproving conversation, right, of my parents who I love, who we have a good relationship with all in all. I have to now work through that in order for me to feel good unless I learn how to decouple those things. So how do you, one is like, how do you shield yourself from some of that, right? But two is how do you just completely break and separate them? My ambition is not tied to your approval. 
And if you disapprove, it doesn't mean that I stop going hard. And sometimes, especially in our earlier stages, when we have an idea that nobody gets, that nobody is in agreement with, that our friends and family don't understand, right? We can take the feedback. Their feedback could be valid. Their feedback could be warranted. But if you've made a decision that you are going to drive towards something, your ambition needs to be completely based off of your ambition and on no one else's approval because you will absolutely face disapprovement. And if you can't handle that, then it will affect how you move. So begin to think if there are places for yourself where you see that ambition that you have a thing that you want to do, a thing you want to drive towards where you start to see that unravel because people who you love and know and care about or people whose opinions you care about, it's okay to care about people's opinions. Like I do care about my parents' opinion. I love them and I respect them. And I think that they've created an, an enormous amount of success considering where my family has started from. So it, it's not necessarily that you don't approve of someone, right? But like, how do you take that and then like backtrack it and make sure that your ambition isn't tied to that approval? So the second thing that we need to decouple is our identity from our outcomes. Our identity from our outcomes. Who I am is not tied to outcome to the outcomes that my life produces or that my work or efforts have produced. One of this, one of these things for me, um, as an example, is my daughter. So while I've shared bits and pieces of things with my daughter, like this is a more transparent um, conversation around my daughter. My daughter just turned 17 um, this month. So very excited about that. Like excited, kind of. I'm sad is not the right word. Like, I don't know what it is like, but you know, my baby is growing up like, oh my God. Right. And so like seeing her turn into this beautiful young lady and then also acknowledging that my baby is a young woman, it's a lot of emotions there. Um, but you know, my daughter, um, has an, an issue with drugs and alcohol, mostly drugs and in, in particular weed and vaping, which is I mean, I come from California, not like the end of the world. I will acknowledge I did not do any drugs or alcohol when I was a teenager. Now, I like them boys, me and them football players. That was a thing. But like, <laughs> but in, but I was not the kid. I was not the teenager that had issues drinking or had issues smoking. I knew kids who smoked. I, you can't grow up in California and not know kids who smoke. You probably can't grow up anywhere in the country and not know kids who smoke, probably. But like, that wasn't my thing. So I don't relate to this issue like of how she operates. When I cut class, it was because I wanted to go hang out with my friends and watch TV as somebody whose parents wasn't finna be home. When she cuts class, she wants to go smoke. So these issues are not, related to the fact that my daughter has grown up in a safe and a loving home. My daughter has had all of her needs taken care of and most of her wants taken care of. If I tied, and this was like the first thing as I was starting to experience this, one of the first things that came up was, oh, you know, you can't be hard on yourself. You've been a great mom. Well, I'm not hard on myself. I believe hundred percent that I've been a great mom. I'm not a perfect mom. I'm not sure that those exist. But I believe in myself to be a great mom, I have to be able to decouple who I am from the outcomes of my daughter's life because she's making her own choices. And she's very close to the age where her choices are going to affect her more than they affect me. But I have to be able to separate those things. We have to be able to separate that inside of our friendships. We have to be able to separate that inside of our work outcomes. If you have gone to work and you have done the best job that you know to have done and a project doesn't go through, does this mean that you are a poor worker? Does this mean that you are not competent? Or are the outcomes separate from who you identify as? So this even takes place in like my business. This was asked of me. You guys know that I launched a coaching business. Actually, this call is a result of me launching this um, consulting company and coaching program. And one of the things that was asked of me recently from a friend of mine who had been considering, he's an expert in his lane, and he had been considering launching a program and he was concerned. And he said, but what if your clients don't get the results that, that you want? And I said, well, I can't guarantee that my clients do the work because I'm not promising you that it's not work. 
I said, what I do is I make sure that what I promise is available. What I said I was going to do is done and they have to be responsible for doing the work. So I can't guarantee outcomes because I can't guarantee that you're going to do the work. I can guarantee that I'll show up as I stated I was going to show up. So I told him I have to decouple the, my client outcomes from my identity as a coach. And I have to be sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and not necessarily that the outcomes that I'm intending or that I would like to pr be produced will be produced without taking that personally. So I get to come back and make sure I've done my job and I get to come back and make sure that I've done my job as a parent, my job as an entrepreneur, my job as a coach, my job as, you know, a, a friend or a daughter or a sister, but the outcomes are not attached to me and how I identify. The third thing that I want to talk about in the decoupling phase is decoupling your identity from success or from failure. Because oftentimes, if we don't succeed at something, so let's take the failure route. If we don't succeed at something, if we're not careful, we can make that like I'm a failure instead of this thing failed. This thing didn't produce what I wanted it to produce. That's not me being a failure. That means this thing didn't produce what I wanted it to produce. This thing didn't happen the way that I wanted it to happen, right? So how do we separate that out? But the same holds true for success. The same holds true for success. You ever heard them people that talk about, well, way back then, you know, well, when I was in high school, I did, like early in my career, I did. And so if you attach an early win or any win as a part of your identity, not as like, I can produce wins, not as a thing that you can do, but attach it to your identity as to who you are. When you don't experience that win, you can stay living in a place that doesn't allow you to move forward. Now you're stuck in this, you know, weird time warped, uh, you know, frame of your life when you created that win or when you created that success and you can't move yourself forward in the process because that win is how you identify and anything that speaks differently to that win, it challenges your identity and it doesn't allow for you to grow. So failures are things that happen in the general course of life and successes are things that happen in the general course of life. And none of those things speak to who I am as a person. They may speak to my habits. They may speak to my networks. They may speak to my grit. They may speak to my perseverance. They don't speak to who I am as a person. I could not produce successful outcomes and I can tie that back to the habits that I need to change in order to create success. I can't call myself a failure. I don't have successful habits. Those are two different things. I can have successful habits and see and see things um, happening for me the way that they should, but know that at any point that that turns or changes, that that's not tied to who I am. That that could be through a number of different factors on the outside that I don't get to control, right? So those three things, decoupling your ambition from the approval of others, decoupling your identity from, your out, from the outcomes of others, and decoupling your identity from your success or your failure. So those are my three things that you need to think about as you shift your mindset to think about how to take yourself on to the next level. My homework for you is, is going to be journaling. It's going to be thinking about which of those decouplings that you need to be focused on in your life in order for you to move to your next level. Where are you tying one of those things together to yourself, to your ambition that you need to undo? What questions do we have? What comments do we have? Well, <clears throat> I don't necessarily have a question. I think this was, you know, a great conversation um, because I was seeing different things. Like, for instance, like, you know, like my brother, he, his, he has his ambition about this business that he does. 
and at least doing. He's been, it seems as though, taking a concerted effort to kind of decouple those things from the expectations of others, which is which is definitely a good thing um, because he's kind of been able to move forward with a little bit clearer focus. So mm-hmm. I have to make sure he catches the replay, though I do invite him, so that's on him. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but the identity from success or failure, you know, resonates with me because though I do understand, you know, success and failure, failure um, you know, they are things that happen one thing that I've been working on doing is by tracking our KPIs. I think I might've talked about this before and then making sure that those, um, like looking at the leading indicators of things kind of that I'm putting in versus what what's coming out of it, mm-hmm. that even though I do and will track those things, that still doesn't necessarily guarantee success, right? So um, right. that is definitely um, something that I'm going to, make sure that I'm taking into account. It is great for me to know like where we are, making sure that we're doing the things and kind of seeing where we're dropping the ball. Uh, I think usually it's in the follow-up and repeated follow-up with people versus the actual initial contact and marketing when it comes to real estate, right? Mm -hmm. So, So it's something that we're, you know, trying to actively track so that we're making sure that we're doing those things. Um, But then, you know, realizing even doing those things, it could be something that still doesn't produce the result that we would like. But yeah, I mean, so when you're tracking something, right? Like the the tracking of something is is what you're saying it is. It is you making an effort to see like where the gaps exist, where I can make improvements, where all, you know all those things are. Right? It's not you. It could be your habits. It could be tied to your habits. It could be tied to your systems. It could be tied to your mindset, right? But it's not tied to you. So if you're not seeing the results that you want, the tracking will help you potentially identify where you need to make a tweak, but you not seeing the results that you want doesn't make like you as Jasmine a failure. You get what I mean? Yep, definitely. Yeah. And I think that's the important part, right? Because when we don't see the outcomes that we want, it's like, okay, well, I might as well just give this up, right? Because it's not working and it's probably not working because of me. And, and, and it's one thing, like, it's one thing to take that as a singular incident, but when you have, let's say in your life experience, more than one failure, right? Especially if you haven't taken the time to address some of those things, when you see failure after failure after failure after failure, it is difficult to not attach those outcomes to yourself. You think I can't do it right. I can't get it right. And there could be things that are underlying in there that may be an aspect of that, right? So when I talked about like, when I talked about shiny object syndrome, so I made a post on my, um, on all my platforms about shiny object syndrome. And I had like, some people were on comments about it, but some people were in my DMs like angry, upset because what they're recognizing is that they have moved from thing to thing to thing and they felt called out about it. (laughs) Like, that's what it is, right? I felt called out because I know that I started this and then jumped to this and then jumped to this and then jumped to this and ain't none of these things really been successful. The reality is, right, it's hit dogs 100%. The reality of it is, is that it does, it still doesn't mean that they are a failure in life. It means that they have a habit of lacking focus, moving from thing to thing. Whenever something gets tough, they can't figure out how to stick with it long enough in order for them to get through. There are things that they can change in order to see the success that they want to see what they have to what they have to tie it to what they have to make sure that they're not doing is tying it to their person that literally becomes the danger because when we talk about people who struggle with mental health issues when we talk about people who struggle with um you know with with self esteem th- that is you tying something to your identity you have embodied something that isn't necessarily true about yourself and you are seeing yourself through the lens of failure instead of instead of identifying the changes and the habits that you need to make in order for you to see the success that you want to see 
But that's why I ha also have to couple that with the success portion, because you have people who have experienced success, especially fast success. Like you get out there and you see, oh, I'm 20 years old and I'm making a million dollars. Like you haven't even lived life yet. Like ain't nothing even had a chance to happen to you. Wait till, you're for wait till you've lived through 20 years. If you tie that early success to your identity and then something changes and you can't uh, decouple that, you can't see the thing that you did or the work that happened or the network that you had or whatever it is that was in that place that helped to curate that success, that's where you'll see somebody who now all of a sudden they're about to lose something, like take the 2008 uh, crashes, right? Where you saw a high, literally a high rate of suicide because people were seeing success and then all of a sudden the market tanked and they were losing that success. The market tanking isn't attached to you. It's an outward circumstance that you can't control, but it could affect your success. It did affect people's success. You had grown men jumping off buildings because the market tanked. And the, the financial success that they had created was gone almost overnight. And mentally they couldn't, they couldn't handle it because they had attached their success to who they were. And now like it was gone, even though it was to no fault of their own. So it, that, that decoupling has to happen on either side, right? So... So I'm separating myself from my affiliations, from controversial celebrities I have partnered with and collaborate with. I am rebranding. I'm in a rebranding phase and I'm tired of being collateral damage due to other people's reputation. Also, I'm not responsible for other people's expectations of me. A hundred percent. So uh, there's a couple of things that you're saying in here. One is separating yourself from affiliations, right? So that is like super clear of, I know this person. I, I can even be cool with this person. I like this person. This person and how they identify, how they speak, what they believe, how they preach it, the manner in which they go about is actually has nothing to do with me. So me knowing someone, me liking someone, me caring for someone, me building a relationship with someone doesn't tie their, um, you know, their thing right to me. And then there's the way in which we we can look at to acknowledge like how my opinion fits in this. And you can look at it like those are relationships that you build, right? But think about it like family. Think about it like family. How many of us have, have family whose opinions have nothing to do with us? Like I feel for, you know, the there's a woman, I can't remember her name, but her one of her sons or her son, I don't, I don't know her story enough, but here's what I know. Her son was one of the shooters in Columbine. And she's gone on a TED talk about how she had to, the work that she's had to do because of the responsibility that she has felt for what her son did, right? But recognizing that like he did an action all on his own, and I'll take the responsibility that I take for his action. This is not your situation, but I'm I'm creating the parallel between the two stories, right? Is when you become affiliated or associated with someone whose actions you actually have no control over. So like her son was in high school. And while we can influence our high schoolers, as I have learned with my own child, right? That I mentioned earlier, like she's 17 years old. She is making decisions for herself. When I was 16, it's like my decision to go into the military was made at 16, really, like I made a decision about what I was going to do. And my parents could not change my decision. The only thing they could do is change the timing of my decision, right? So like people grow up and they build their own, they, they create their own decisions. Your affiliation to them needs to be able to be separated and you can't identify with that, right? So she has to not identify with, with the actions of her son. That's just an example, but hopefully that makes sense in terms of like not I not making that pair, you know, that um identification with what someone else is doing with what with where you are. And so yes, 100 percent rebranding, but like also vehemently stating, not just to everyone else, but like to to the people that want to create, like as you said, the collateral damage, right? Like 
I'm not a part, I'm not a part of that. Me and your relationship is not a part of that actually. So, um, and then you also mentioned um, the expectations that other people have for you. And that is something that I talk to early on in my program, right? Like my program is called, excuse me while I live intentionally because people hold us to expectations. And oftentimes when we're not aware of them, we hold ourselves to, we try to meet their expectations even at times when we haven't agreed that this is an expectation I wanna be held to. So when you're a child, it's a little bit harder, right? Like your parents are there to create expectations for you. They're there to help share and mold and guide you until you can make your own decisions. But as an adult, we oftentimes have struggled to release those expectations because it is a part of the initial um, training and grooming that we have. So we are essentially trained to consider expectations right from the beginning. And there's like, I want to make sure that we're clear, like there's nothing wrong with having expectations set. But then at some point when you elevate to the next level, you get to assess those expectations and make a decision about whether these expectations serve you, you agree with them and you intend to keep them or you don't. And what that means, like in a job, if you have, a, if you work for someone, I have this expectation of what your role is going to produce in my business right? Or at this company. And you are now agreeing to meet those expectations as a condition of employment. Should you not meet those expectations, then you accept that you may no longer be employed here. But you get to make the decision. The, 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 the decision-making power lies with you. And then you rise to meet those expectations or you don't, right? But when we deal with people relationally in friendships and in, um, more autonomous business relationships and uh, and familial relationships and things like that, we often have expectations placed on us that we don't even have conversation about. So I expect, you know, I had this conversation with a friend of mine. I actually had a friend recently that I didn't hear from. And to be clear, my close friends, like I talk to my close friends pretty regularly. So when I didn't hear from this person who I deem to be a close friend, um, who knows, that I like to hear from my close friends regularly, I was really upset and offended. Like what just happened here? And it felt like this weird, um, like I was, I was, I, I was confused. Like, are you mad at me? Like what just happened? Like, how come I haven't heard from you? So when they came back online, they were like, it had nothing to do with you. Like this, this was me and what I did for me. And we had a whole conversation about the expectation of communication. And at the end of the day, I had to back up. And I was like, well, Actually, I held an expectation that we would communicate a certain way that you actually didn't agree to. So my bad, I apologize. And now we can have that conversation so that we can have right set expectations about how we each like to be treated as a friend. And we've been friends for long enough that we just had never had the conversation. Like things had just flowed naturally without ever having the conversation. So in relationships, you find that we are often, we often have expectations that we actually haven't had a conversation about. So when they're not met, it's like, it, it can feel like a blow, but really we should just be able to have an adult conversation about that. Well, I expected this. And are you in agreement with that? Because once we become, once we get into an agreement, then I can hold you to that. And you get a chance to say, actually, that doesn't work for me. And I don't want to be held to that standard or vice versa. So hopefully that's helpful. Other thoughts, comments? Y'all out here making it easy for me. Y'all don't got no questions. It's a QA. and a I ain't got no questions. Let's plan. All right, y'all. Well, if you don't have anything for me, if all hearts and minds are clear, I'm going to release you back to your day. I want to thank you for joining me. Um, of course, as you know, I work with high performance professionals that want to do more of what they love. So if that is you, make sure that you connect with me and we'll get on a call and um, see how I can be of service to you. And until next time, which is next Wednesday at 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern and 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, I will see you then.